makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix with The Conversations That Matter, and here's what's coming up on today's program. European stocks lower, and Japan's 10-year yield jumps the most in a year. With increasing bets, the BOJ will scrap the world's last negative interest rate regime as soon as this month. The latest German industrial output data adds to evidence that Europe's largest economy is on track for a recession, with production in October shrinking unexpectedly. And later this hour on Bloomberg UK, we also take a look at the British government's green record as negotiations continue at COP28 in Dubai. So let's take a look at the European markets map. A lot going on actually in today's trading session. A lot of the focus, of course, is on Japan soon scrapping the last negative interest rate regime. What that means, it probably means that we'll have repercussions across the board. Now, if you look at global markets, they're definitely moving in response to that. You can see European stocks actually opening a little bit lower. I'm also looking at the yield on the 10-year Treasury, which is always significant. It added some seven basis points, the dollar falling for the first time in four days. So it's all about the Bank of Japan's December policy meeting, and traders now see it as a live event after comments from Governor Ueda and his deputy, Ryozo Himino. Now, joining us for more on the markets is Maya Bandari, Global Head of Multi-Assets at BNP Paribas Asset Management. Maya, so great to see you. Thank you so much for coming on. We, Japan kind of changes everything if, if they actually go ahead and, and loosen. What are you expecting from them? Um, so, uh, well, as, as you know, we've had a, a, a pretty long duration bias. I think I, the last time I was here, I was talking about how long duration was our, our highest conviction trade. Uh, and I think Japan sort of sits aside uh, from that. And actually, just yesterday, uh, uh, we have gone uh, short uh, uh, JGBs uh, because I think Japan is in a different place to the rest of the world. So I'm not sure that it changes that, that global narrative. I mean, I think we, we reckon uh, Japan uh, is, is, is positioning itself to start hiking interest rates early next year, uh, just as other uh, G10 central banks are, are, are going to ease. Uh, I, I think Japan uh, wants inflation uh, to, to be a little bit higher. Uh, they've effectively abandoned... Uh, 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 yield curve control. So I think from an investor's perspective, uh, the risk of, uh, of the Bank of Japan uh, really squeezing, squeezing you out uh, seems a little bit less. Uh, and then, of course, there's the, uh, there's the whole uh, uh, benefit uh, for Japanese investors, uh, given the hedging costs uh, from owning uh, global markets relative, relative to JGBs. So, so actually, we sort of saw uh, uh, JGBs as a bit of an opportunity because JGBs rallied along with everything else uh, in, in, in November. And yet, uh, strike us as being in, in, in quite a different place, actually. Yeah, My you. unbelievable to think that we're, you know, early December kind of going towards the end of the year. Is it still going to be inflation central banks driving everything in markets or is there a point where we see actually earnings depression? Oh, that's, a, that, that's a great question because I think duration uh, and, and ex expectations around interest rates have been the driver mm -hmm. uh, uh, for markets. Now, uh, for us, going into 2024, uh, although we have clipped back some of our long duration with that short JGB trade I, I, I just described, uh, we remain uh, long, long, long duration. That is a high conviction view, particularly in U.S. real yields at the longer end, EM local, European investment grade. So we, we do think that carries on. Uh, but, but on the earnings side, um, uh, we are a little, a little bit more cautious. So we're, we're still, uh, we're still at the uh, still underweight uh, equities. And I think, uh, you know, when we look at what we got from this earnings season, uh, you know, in Europe, for example, uh, a miss on on quite weak trailing uh, uh, earnings, uh, but also really weak forward guidance. And that's something that uh, you know should drive forward-looking uh, asset market returns. Uh, and Maya, if you look at some of your conviction calls, so your cautious on equities, especially in Europe, modest longs in defensive markets, I mean, what's the problem with Europe? Because a lot of the things are, are cheap. Do you worry about a, a, a deeper downturn than elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, you, you're right. Think, think, things are cheap. Uh, but when we look at the expected level of earnings uh, for, for the consensus, for example, we're still in uh, sort of, you know, single digits, mid to high single digits. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, the European macro setup, as I think you reflected earlier on, is, is, is pretty weak. And um, European companies are highly levered uh, to that, given the, the operational leverage uh, of these companies. And so uh, earnings, to our mind, uh, could easily fall by the amount that they are currently projected uh, to rise by. So hence, hence 
Eastern's Europe is an area of some caution for us. Uh, against that, we sort of have, uh, we, we like, uh, um, uh, modestly like, I should say, because they're very mo small positions, but uh, we favor defensive growth uh, in, in the U.S. I'd call defensive value in the U.K., because the U.K. market's also very cheap, but a bit more defensively composed. Yep. Uh, and we like some idiosyncratic emerging market stories as, as a bit of a diversifier. I mean, that's important. If you look at emerging markets, I don't know whether that's linked to also some of the focus, for example, on green technology and some of the money transfer, which is still small, or is it just on structural value? benefits? Uh, well, I think, again, it depends which emerging market, uh, which emerging market uh, we're, we're looking at. I mean, I think one of the markets that we quite like, for example, uh, is, is Brazil. Uh, and I think in Brazil, you could point to cyclical support uh, from a macro perspective. But you'd also say, well, look, look at how far earnings expectations are rising. Look at the earnings revision ratios. And then look at how cheap Brazilian equities are relative uh, to global equities. Uh, so that's how we would, we would think about some of, some of those markets. Um, and why, is there anything else in the emerging markets? Again, how do you play? Is it equities, currencies, or bonds? Um, so we like EM local bonds as part of that, that broad, uh, that broad uh, favor, uh, favorable disposition uh, mm -hmm. towards duration. These are positions we were building yeah. up as we had a, yeah. quite a savage sell-off uh, just not, not so long ago. Uh, so we like EM, EM local bonds. We're, we're neutral on emerging market equities overall, but, but as I said, have a, have a, have a, a modest bias uh, mm -hmm. towards some of the, some, some, some the latter markets like, uh, like Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, we did like China uh, uh, earlier in the year. Uh, but but uh, um, we've, we've stepped away uh, and, and stick at neutral because there, again, we see a lot of value. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the trigger to unlocking that value um, uh, is, is, is less clear to us. It's been interesting to see how, how little, uh, in, in some ways, uh, equities have responded to, to some stimulus announcements coming out of, out of the yeah. Chinese that in the past you would have had uh, perhaps a bit more uh, uh, of a response. Maya, what do you do with China right now? Uh, in terms of investments or companies that actually have exposure to China? Um, so China, as I say, uh, we are, we're neutral overall. Uh, um, uh, we, we like Brazil that benefits from, uh, from China but has its own uh, domestic story uh, uh, going as well. Uh, and, of course, EM Local, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, a play on rates rather, the, rather than equities uh, and where, where China has a le less, no. uh, less um, significant uh, impact, if you will, right? So China is a third or so of equity indices 10% of, of EM local. And finally, Maya, what do you do with the UK? So again, we're, we're seeing an election probably yeah. in the next, well, we don't know, but certainly by the time that January 2025 comes along. Yeah. And so there's a lot of political factioning. What does it mean for assets and stock markets? Um, so uh, on, on the UK, uh, we, uh, we actually liked gilts uh, relative, relative to, to some of the European markets uh, like, like boons. And uh, as we had a really, really quite powerful uh, move uh, in, in, in those spreads, we've taken profits on that. So we've stepped away from being uh, long of gilts. Uh, but as I said, you know, we, we quite like UK equity markets uh, within, uh, within a cautious view on equities overall. Mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, you know, UK markets are, number one, very attractively valued. Uh, number two, offer you uh, a bit of a bit of defensiveness, both from a sector composition, but also from the from the yield you get on some of these uh, UK companies uh, and uh, and policy, particularly on, on on the monetary side. That discount rate picture uh, we think could be could be quite positive uh, for, uh, for for UK uh, for UK risk assets. Maya, thank you so much. As always, Maya Bandari, there, a global head of multi assets at BNP Paribas Asset Management. Coming up, China's President Xi Jinping calls for more cooperation with the EU. What does this mean for the bloc's relationship? with Beijing. More on that next, and this is Bloomberg. The conversations that matter, the insights that you need, this is a pulse, and I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, the Chinese President Xi Jinping has told European Union leaders that the two sides should step up cooperation. Well, Xi met with the Commission President Ursula von der Leyen and the Council President Charles Michel in the Chinese capital earlier today. Now, let's bring in Bloomberg's Alan Wan. Alan, good morning, good afternoon for you. What are the major disagreements between China and the EU, and are they different from China and U.S.? Well, you know, actually, there are a lot of the disagreements are similar to the U.S. Uh, you've got, uh, you know, the trade, of course. You got human rights. You got the war in Ukraine. Uh, but there's one major, uh, one disagreement uh, that, that differs, and that's uh, the fact that it, with the U.S., there's a major defense and military component to their tense relations uh, that you don't necessarily see in in Europe. Um, so the biggest bugaboo for the EU 
uh, is, uh, is, is actually, it's a trade deficit with China. It's $400 billion right now, well, last year anyway. Um, it's huge. And it's so big that uh, Vandalay said that it says that it's unsustainable. And, and that's really one of the reasons why the EU launched a probe into uh, Chinese EVs for possible subsidies. Um, trade is so, such a hot political issue, and it's probably one of the reasons why Italy said that it's pulling out of the Belt and Road, mm -hmm. uh, just because its trade deficit with, with China has ballooned uh, since it signed the, uh, uh, its, its, its pact with uh, China on the Belt and Road. Um, so th so th th that's probably like the biggest bugaboo. But then you got other issues like Ukraine. Uh, of course, uh, the EU is going to ask China to sort of prevent Russia from circumventing sanctions. And the EU also wants China to do more, some more have some more tangible, tangible progress in terms of uh, providing more market access to, U to EU firms. Uh, the EU Chamber of Commerce uh, president in China said today, which I agree with, that one way they can do that is by allowing European firms to, uh, to be able to bid for massive public procurement projects in China. So what does this mean for the EU-China relationship going forwards? And frankly, we saw actually Italy get out of the Belt and Road, and that felt very significant. Yeah, I mean, it is. But you know something? Uh, China went around and said that, uh, OK, well, Italy wants to pull out, but we're, we're still willing to work with Europe. Uh, Europe has a, as a sort of like its own Belt and Road called Golden Gateway Project. And China says that it's willing to work with the EU on this, on, on, this, on, uh, on, this, on, uh, on sort of infrastructure around the world. Uh, except in strategic areas. And, but overall, the relationship is going to remain bumpy, mainly because of trade. Um, China has said that it considers the EU probe into Chinese EV, EV subsidies as no, no more than trade protectionism. And it's one issue that China mm -hmm. is not going to want to forego just because subsidies you know, are a major plank of China's economic uh, development strategy. Um, that said, I, I, th I think that there are some positives as well. In the last few weeks, we've seen China... Uh, allowing uh, uh, citizens from several European nations visa-free travel, and that's going to be able to boost, uh, mm -hmm. you know, exchanges of, uh, between people, especially after a lot of European expats left uh, during the lockdowns. But all in all, I have to agree with the EU team of, of commerce president in China, saying that uh, deep issues stand in the way of a good mm -hmm. EU-China relations. Thank you so much, Bloomberg's Alan Wang there with the very latest on the EU and China. Now, oil was also on the agenda during Vladimir Putin's trip to Saudi and the UAE, pretty much as expected. Now, it's Russian president's first time visiting the energy-rich region since his invasion of Ukraine almost two years ago. Well, Bloomberg's Dana Krejci joins us with the latest. So, Dana, what do the UAE and Saudi Arabia actually stand to gain from hosting Putin? And what does Putin's visit signify in political terms? Hi. So Putin stands to gain a lot from this, right? He is sending a message um, that he is not as isolated as the West and its allies want him to be, that he's very, still very relevant and he will um, get the uh, massive ceremonies and the receptions like we saw in the UAE and Saudi Arabia as well. And there was a significant quote from uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman uh, of Saudi Arabia during his meeting with uh, Putin and he said, described him as, open quote, a special and a highly esteemed guest in the kingdom, both by the government and its people. And that shows um, the importance of maintaining this relationship uh, between Saudi Arabia and uh, Russia. Um, for Saudi Arabia and the UAE, it's part of their diplomatic push. They want to raise their profile globally. Um, they want to increase their soft power and become more influential um, in regional and um, global politics and so this is them also saying look we can host putin we can host like saudi arabia hosted Zelensky uh, a few months ago also uh, uh in, in in jeddah actually not in riyadh um and so this is part of saudi arabia's trying to bolster its image uh, on the global stage. And the UAE hosts um, a big number of a lot of uh, Russian companies and the Russian nationals who found um, Dubai to be a safe place for them to be. So that is also significant for Putin to be uh, in the UAE. So what did the visit actually achieve? What did Putin's visit to Saudi Arabia achieve? Um, what, you know, whether coincidentally or not, the visit's timing comes after the OPEC Plus alliance said that they would extend and deepen their oil production cuts to bolster oil prices. So 
Putin and uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, they both discussed uh, energy cooperation. And they need to show a united front. They want to show close coordination. They are key members of the Open Plus Alliance and the drivers of it. And they both need mm -hmm. oil prices to be up. Um, for Putin, it funds his uh, war in Ukraine. And for Saudi Arabia, it is funding and needs that liquidity to fund its massive economic transformation program. So for both, it's a big risk if oil prices fall down. So what they're trying to do is keep it up and, and that image of a united front, they're hoping, um, and close coordination, they're hoping that that would um, give the market kind of a, a sign that they would probably take a further step uh, to do so. Dana, thanks so much. Dana Kreitzer there with the very latest on Putin in Saudi and the UAE. Now, coming up, we have some lines from the U.S. Senate hearing, which is featuring chief executives from America's biggest banks. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. Now, on Capitol Hill yesterday, Wall Street bosses took their most direct aim yet at Washington's plans to force them to set aside more cash as a buffer against losses. Now, executives tried to reassure lawmakers that Americans' assets are safe in their hands. We had 10 years to do this, and it's shocking to me that we're sitting up there 10 years and we're talking about what they're going to do for small business, and we have to analyze it today. It has much more an impact than people think. Additional increases are wholly unnecessary. Almost every element of the Basel III endgame proposal would make lending and other financial activities more expensive. As it stands, the proposal would increase the cost of capital and borrowing across the economy. As the cost of debt goes up, it certainly can create volatility in our funding treasuries. It can create volatility in the treasury market. It'll particularly diminish mortgages for lower income people. Ultimately, punitive to economic growth and doesn't strike the right cost benefit analysis. It was not thoughtfully done. I'm not sure it was shared fully among all the regulators. Uh, this should be we looked at. Well, let's bring in Bloomberg's uh, Tom McCaff from our finance team. I mean, first of all, it was quite funny seeing them all lined up like that. I mean, I hadn't really seen that before because usually it's like one or two at a time and not all of them. What was your biggest takeaway? Yeah, yeah you had all eight of the big U.S. bank CEOs. So one was those comments we just heard then where they're all lined up slamming, as we know, Basel III. But two, for me, I was watching this, look, waiting for sort of some fiery exchanges, some sort of excitement there. But actually, largely, it was all very cordial. Even sort of Senator Warren didn't really go after them. So, and the banks were largely talking the same book. Yeah, and, and as you're saying, there were few fire exchanges. But let's uh, take a listen uh, to what Jamie Dimon had to say about crypto. I've always been deeply opposed to crypto, Bitcoin, etc. You pointed out the only true use case for it is criminals drug traffickers, anti-money laundering, tax avoidance, and that is a use case. If I was the government, I'd close it down. I mean, that was quite punchy. It was said in, you know, a very cool voice, but it was quite yeah. punchy. No, no, exactly. This is probably his favorite topic, actually, I'd say, and he really went after them, and, and then you had the senators kind of agree, and so it was this, normally you have, you know, the senators versus the bankers, and in this case, everyone was lined up, effectively, you know, piling in on crypto. Um, any other topics that caught your eye? Well, I did enjoy this one exchange, which is kind of also a little bit fiery, back on Basel III, where effectively, you know, one of the senators, I think Senator Brown, was, was just saying, look, you guys are all out here slamming things. You're putting money up against, you know, this thing. Is that really the best thing you, you guys can be doing with your time? Um, and otherwise, you know, I, I thought it was a lovely description of the uh, regional banking crisis in the U.S., not as a, a banking crisis, but a crisis for those three banks in particular, which I think captures really very well that sort of um, crazy period earlier in the year. Tom, why do you think the mood was so subdued? Is it be because, you know, they don't really have anything to go after the big banks right now? Or is it, you know, do they have bigger problems to focus on? Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah, normally you've got people kind of standing up and, you know, making yeah. maybe some political yeah. points. And, and perhaps that reflects that, you know, largely the, the banking industry managed to navigate the sort of earlier crises. Um, and I think that's the other thing. Crypto is a very easy punching bag. Mm -hmm. And so when, you know, everyone's piling in on something that everyone sees, they can maybe get a bit of advantage out of it. Just looks like happy families. For now. For now. Tom, for now. thank you so much, as always. Tom McCaff there, who oversees all of our European banking coverage. Now let's get to some other top red stories on the Bloomberg Terminal. Senate Republicans have blocked $66 billion in emergency Ukraine aid, heightening the risk that U.S. funding for Kiev's war effort will dry up. Now, no Republicans supported the procedural motion to consider the bill, which failed by 49 to 51, well short of the 60 votes needed.
The UN chief, Antonio Guterres, has dramatically escalated his call for a ceasefire in Gaza, invoking the most powerful tool available to a secretary general for the first time in five decades. Well, Guterres sent the letter under Article 99 of the UN Charter, which allows him to bring any issue seen as threatening international peace to the Security Council's attention. And the UK immigration minister has quit just hours after the government's new asylum seeker deportation plan was published. Well, Robert Jenrick's departure comes after the legal changes which aim to ensure ministers can finally proceed with their controversial Rwandan deportation program. And former UN ambassador Nikki Haley has solidified her claim to be the main alternative to Donald Trump for the Republican nomination. With the polls shifting in her favor, the fourth GOP debate saw Haley drawing attacks from her rivals over her connections to Wall Street donors and hawkish foreign policy views. Coming up, the UK government promises it's still committed to net zero at COP28. But did they convince anyone after their recent watering down of Britain's green agenda? Our deep dive on the pulse is next, and this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.